The Templari Skientei, or Templars of Knowledge in Low Gothic, are a strange and esoteric loyalist space marine chapter. Their exact origins and circumstances surrounding their creation is shrouded in mystery, as are their constant whereabouts. The chapter is known to have worked alongside Adeptus Mechanicus Explorator fleets on multiple occasions due to their proximity to a forge world located near to the fringes of the galaxy, recovering ancient techno-arcane lore and technologies from ancient battlefields or destroyed human civilizations and restoring them to war-capable status. With the few extant accounts that exist, the only thing that can be ascertained for certain is that this ancient chapter officially appeared sometime during the 32nd millennium. Officially, they are listed as hailing from the genetic lineage of the venerable first founding Dark Angels Legion, but the truth of their heritage is a far more complicated and complex issue, one that could see them fall under the scrutiny of outside Imperial authorities and see them yet declared as renegades. The history of the Templary Skiente and its existence are as cryptic as their official progenitor, the Dark Angels. Their exact founding is unknown, with a few records dating to early M32, making them probably an unnamed second or third founding chapter, even though they are not mentioned in the Apocrypha of Davio, the great and holy document created in M33 that lists all the Adeptus Astartes chapters created during the second founding, or really any official imperial records of that time. Following their inception, during the chapter's early years of existence, the Templary made the bleak and rocky planet of Marodia their chapter homeworld. This world operated in the middle of the Ultima Segmentum. Early on, the Templary were noted for possessing little deviation from their parent chapter, having claimed and proven to be worthy inheritors of the lineage of Lionel Johnson. As a Dark Angel successor chapter, they too became a part of the Unforgiven and so the chapter's highest authorities learned of the Dark Angel's grim past. They would carry out their duty with extreme loyalty and were able to catch an unknown amount of fallen and make them repent for their betrayal. But as time went on and the stagnation of the Imperium made itself present, a change within the Templary would occur. The chapter continued to serve the Imperium faithfully, pledging their lives and fate of their chapter upon their own merits for the remainder of M32 and the early centuries of M33. During this time, their gene seed was said to be pure and very stable. But, eventually, one of the chapter's apothecaries uncovered the sinister truth about their dark origins sometime in the last century of M33. Found hidden within their progenitor's gene seed helix was a second strain from an unknown progenitor. A curious apothecary of the chapter discovered this by an unknown, said to be highly complex, unique and not repeatable process, though it is believed that there was outside help involved. His discovery would set off a chain of various events shaping the chapter into what it is today. Once the sinister origins of this second strain were found, the chapter underwent a betrayal of immense magnitude. Very quickly, a chapter-wide schism formed as the first three companies, led by their chapter master, proclaimed the Imperium to be made out of lies and proceeded to secede themselves away from the Imperium of Man, proper. Battle brothers of various companies would soon join the secessionist brethren as well, with only the last few reserve companies and the majority of the chapter's librarians remaining loyal. The battle that ensued was cataclysmic and would destroy Marodia, splitting the planet into four giant chunks of rock. If anyone knew the truth of the destruction of the Dark Angel's homeworld of Caliban, they might compare the ill fortune that befell the Templary's homeworld and say, like father, like son. The chapter's fortress ministry, however, was still left intact due to being part of one of the larger chunks of the doomed planet, and it had managed to activate its shields, but their traitorous brethren had already plundered several of the chapter's ancient relics left within, leaving behind seemingly worthless books, data and broken war gear, as well as ancient vehicles that couldn't be transported easily due to their lack of time. The chapter took what little they could salvage from the ashes and ruins and ventured scarred by their new reality in search of a new home. Having temporarily no homeworld, the chapter was forced to go on a search for a new place to live. Grievous losses and a battered fleet left the chapter very under-equipped to dealing with threats on their way. In addition, a curse manifested itself. For the first years, many Astartes succumbed to it. 
Little accounts remain from that period, but tales suggest the chapter being reduced to an estimated 200 Astartes during that time. The aforementioned curse is still, to the Templaries' present day, a mystery considering how it works and why the chapter is linked to it. Those unfortunate individuals that are blessed by it start receiving visions in form of nightmares. These nightmares are blurry, often leaving the affected remembering one thing – screams of help. Such visions worsen with every passing day and night. At the end, at an undetermined time, the affected Astartes will be ripped out of his own world, his own consciousness transported seemingly through space and time itself to witness various events of the past. The few survivors that survived that stage described as having witnessed the destruction of a planet, the burning of a great white city, and many more cataclysmic battles, or in some cases, pure slaughter, while unable to intervene. Meanwhile, his physical body becomes frozen, eyes staring into the direction he last was standing in. First helpless, the unaffected couldn't do anything but grant their lost brethren the Empress peace. But as time progressed on the chapter's voyage to find a new home, the librarians, the only one that proved immune, started to discover and try ways to prevent the curse from taking more of their brethren. For several millennia, the librarians of the chapter had kept vigilant and watched over their brethren, until they were recently succeeded by the Umbre Angeli in this assignment. Naturally, this has led to the Templari being far more trusting of their psycho brethren than many other chapters, who usually like to keep their distance. An estimated 100 years passed, and as the chapter ventured to the south, continuing to seek out a new world to call their home, they wished to join Ultima South due to the lack of Imperial forces and its remoteness in an attempt to rebuild the chapter, but their intentions were twofold. In the words of the Librarians, it invited them. But it was also to note that the Forge World of Berethwell was sending out a call for assistance. Eventually, the Templary would arrive in the system of Eritral. The Eritral system consisted largely of gas giants with only Eritral, Berethral and Berylum being habitable planets, with the latter having been perched in the following years. In addition, the chapter felt duty-bound to act as guardians of this isolated region due to the constant Xenus presence in the form of a nearby large concentration of Orcs. As such, the system never had the possibility of building up industrialized hive worlds, with the world of Berethral being the only exception to that rule, but it was constantly experiencing attacks from various Xenus raiding parties. A particularly large orc infestation had paralyzed the system, and the Templary, even at their lowest, could not abandon their duty. With the arrival of the Templary came aid and recognition, due to there being a continuous presence of an Adeptus Astartes chapter, making the system now home to both the Forge World and the Chapter Homeworld. The planet Eritral, a planet of landscapes filled with ancient ruins and large concentrations of subterranean humans living underground, was given to the Templary formally in 4.034.445 M34. Now, Many millennia later, the chapters manage to keep their dreadful past a secret while they continue their never-ending quest to hunt down almost all of those that once betrayed them. By this time, the Templary had changed even more. They had embraced their origins and had become guardians of knowledge, becoming experts in seemingly lost technologies, plasma weaponry and fine weapons crafting. The Templary often volunteered a sizable portion of Astartes for exploration missions and have established well-rooted relations to the Mechanicus, particularly the Barathralian Forge World. For every good that may attempt to rise, there will be a counterbalance. A bloody attack launched by the Warband Champions of Nuceria, joined by the forces of Hellforge Fornax, was the counterbalance in that regard. Due to the chapter being largely split and absent in various campaigns and exploration missions, Eritral proved easy picking. Chaos cults rose from the feral subterrane populace and heretic-endorsing tech priests unveiled their true intentions. The warband is known for joining the losing side of battle in hopes of prolonging a conflict and maximize casualties. An uprising that would have been normally suppressed became the undoing of the Eritral system. The various temples that acted as construction sites for the large tanks to the smallest, finely made bolt pistol were an invaluable target for a warband in search of valuable war gear. 
How the warband, however, eventually found out about the uprising remains largely a mystery, but it is believed that a devoted Zinch worshipper found out about the Templary's origins and waited for a perfect opportunity to eliminate the chapter in an attempt to teach them a lesson about the experiences of their undisclosed second gene sire. In the end, the temples were evacuated and the Pyramid of Azura became the last heavily fortified place on the planet Eritral, all the while Berethral erupted into a schism, unable to provide aid. The arrival of the Templary came too late to allow their world to be saved, with the exception of the Pyramid of Azura and its librarians of amassed knowledge. Eritral was scourged of life by sunflare shots, but not before most of the warband had pillaged and looted all temples, with the exception of the Pyramid of Azura. The planets were scorched, with the warband already having set course to their next target, and as such, killing off mostly all remaining cultists and heretics that did not run away with their spoils of war. The monastery survived due to its powerful void shields and would remain perhaps the only remaining fully intact structure upon the surface of the now completely lifeless surface of the planet, covered by grey, endless oceans of ash. Even if faced with the harsh reality of the Imperium, the Templary are content on carrying on the will of the Great Crusade, even if only on a minuscule scale, using their own collection of knowledge to adapt if required. While a now burnt planet, with no surface populace and actual buildings, Eritral would be utterly worthless were it not for the many underground caverns filled with humans that live harsh lives and the yet undiscovered secrets of the planet's many ruins, like cities that originated in the age of technology. In addition, the planet also possesses native psychic crystals that grow in the massive underground caverns that are invaluable to the chapter's librarians. One of the less noble reasons would be because several ancient secrets of the chapter were left on the planet following the burning of Eritral, with the chapter leaving no evidence or trail behind. For a simple mistake, our dispatched mercy could compromise the Templary status. Loyalty is its own reward, is a saying strongly emphasized among the chapter members and is an integral part of motivational speeches held by chaplains. The Templary now are roaming the stars with the eternal Goliath, defending the Imperium, uncovering new knowledge and technologies across mankind's realm, while continuing their hunt for the Fallen, having eradicated their own renegades in several engagements successfully. Those renegades that did not yet repent for their past treachery have completely dispersed and lost any sense of former self by having joined different Chaos warbands. Thus, they have proven themselves to be no threat anymore to the chapter. The chapter walks on thin line and will certainly never be able to find moments of respite for the possibility of being exposed in an unacceptable outcome. Only eternal vigilance will allow the chapter to live on. However, even in these harsh times, faced with the most harshest of realities, the chapter continues to hold on and serve mankind with all of their possibilities. They have turned their attention towards the recovery of ancient wonders and returning them to an operational status which has secured them several exclusive benefits they enjoy in terms of technological strength. And with that additional strength, they proudly stand defiant against fate and continually deliver merciless justice to those that wronged mankind. The Templary's Gene Seed Helix has 80% Dark Angel's origins, with the rest being a stable and adapted strain of their second undisclosed progenitor. The chapter's Gene Seed, as such, is very stable. However, this Gene Seed has a more complex build, making the process of a recruit growing to a fully grown Astartes slower compared to many other Space Marine chapters, but has a higher success rate for each individual that is given the chapter's Gene Seed. In addition, if a psychic individual is blessed with the gene seed of the Templary and survives, the second strain unlocks psychic potency and a possible higher mastery of the warp that is both extremely dangerous if not properly used, but invaluable and is often paired with the Templary's amassed ancient arcane knowledge. While stable and pure, the curse that lingers on the normal Templary brethren is a mystery yet unsolved. Nevertheless, the Umbria and Jelly have developed many ways to prevent from the curse to take root in brethren, starting from the earliest of stages to the last one. 
Apart from the librarian's presence allowing to negate the curse to take root by itself, Umbre and Jelly have several options on how to quote-unquote cut or sever the ties between the Astartes and the manifested curse. Having developed many techniques with the help of their own experiences and ancient tombs to peer into the victim's mind and help them. Perhaps the biggest blessing the chapter has gotten is that the second strain is unable to be discovered by imperial methods of gene seed analysis, making them appear as true sons of the lion to the gene vaults of the Adeptus Terra. However, whether or not the Dark Angels librarians can feel the slight difference in the genetic makeup of the Templary remains a question that bothers the chapter's inner circle. Based on the fact of how they were and are treated like any unforgiven chapter and have served for almost ten entire millennia undisturbed, it is assumed within the chapter that the Dark Angels may indeed not know their secret. However, the Dark Angels are by all means not an easy chapter to deceive and due to their surveillance of the unforgiven as a whole, they may actually in fact know much more than the chapter thinks. Reclusive in nature, the chapter lived on their homeworld Eritral, far in the galactic south, and before that in the galactic middle on Merodia. Together with Berethral, they spent their time with recovering lost technologies, furthering their knowledge, and at the very least, partially trying to restore their own system to a highly sophisticated level. The chapter always had a natural affinity for plasma weapons, their designs and construction, and combining them with arcane prowess of their librarians, a trait most likely inherited from their progenitors. The chapter adheres to the limits and guidelines of the Codex Astartes, but with a heavy degree of deviation. The chapter's Mythos Templorum Scientae, a document that existed ever since the discovery of the truth about their own origins, is the collection of the chapter's entire history, both their greatest and darkest deeds, as well as their most used tactics, most valiant heroes, their own culture and traditions, etc. While the Templary Scientae are adherent to the Codex Astartes, because several of its suggestions and tactics were integrated into the document, the book also tells of the value that comes from one's own mind and the necessity of adaptation to any and all threats. Rumours and whispers also talk about ancient tomes of arcane lore, their existence dating as far back as the Age of Strife or even further being integrated into this complied document. The many various contents of the Mythos Templorum Scientae are far too numerous to exactly tell. Only members of the Inner Circle carry copies of this book, but it is not uncommon, if not already traditional, to read excerpts during morning or evening prayers, in order to properly attune the Battle Brothers in their minds and bodies, while also rooting them into chapter culture. Knowledge of the past and present are key aspects to the life of a Templary Astartes, for without this knowledge he walks a dangerous path towards the clouded and uncertain future. Only the reaffirmation of the deeds of his ancestors can allow a Marine to prevail in these trying times. Due to the unique circumstances of their homeworld, its surface possesses no possibility of unnecessary distraction and it's not uncommon to see several battle brothers strolling through the upper areas of the monastery during their short periods of free time or when assigned a task of creating a secret manuscript. To gaze upon the ashen wastelands of the planet is to remind oneself of his sacred duty to avenge that which was lost and absolve those which have fallen. The sins of the past must and shall not be forgotten, but ignoring them only makes the enemy stronger and threatens those who fight for and with. While still somewhat monastic in their culture, just like their progenitors, they are often seen to wear tabards, robes and their use of chaplains, they do not worship the Emperor as a god. Instead, they perceive him as a perfect human image all should strive for, his teachings of putting high value on understanding and knowledge form an integral part of the chapter's images. Their robes, armor and the hulls of the many war machines of the chapter are often inscribed with passages from the Mythos Templorum Scientae. As such, some may say that the chapter practices the belief and intentions that were seen in the Great Crusade. The chapter is also keen on recovering and keeping the knowledge and technology of the Imperium's ancient founders, trying to gain insight into the past. Some may call it an obsession on their end, but the overlapping intentions of the chapter with the Mechanicus has led to favorable relations between them, awarding them not just a great amount of the finest Astartes gear yet producible, but also a great cache of functioning relics. 
The chapter abides to the teachings of the Dark Angels and thus abides to the Codex Astartes, with the exception of the first two companies. The first company, also called the Scarab Wing, named after ancient Terran insects with particularly hard exoskeletons, is similar to the Deathwing formation of their primogenitor chapter in that it holds a massive amount of Terminator armored units and is used to teach its members about the existence and truth of the Fallen. But unlike the other Unforgiven, an even worse secret burdens the chapter. Those warriors that make it to the first company must be extraordinary individuals, for they will have to also learn of the chapter's convoluted heritage. The Scarab Wing is the bulwark of the chapter's beliefs, both in mind and body, as each warrior is a brick of a gigantic, ceramide-clad wave of unrelenting and burning vengeance. It is rare to see strike forces of this company to be unaccompanied by the chapters Umbre and Jelly, for their knowledge and willpower is great, and their powers are potent. While one would need the inspiring words of a chaplain to allow battle brothers to commit great deeds, the Templary's respect for their Umbre and Jelly makes for a rather effective substitute, assisting their brothers not just by providing additional offense or defense, but also the ability to greatly buff the capabilities of each warrior and strengthening their resolve even in the most unlikely scenarios. The second company is known as the Stormwing, named after one of the ancient Dark Angels' infamous Six Wings. It is the chapter's fastest company, similar to that of the Ravenwing companies. It holds a massive amount of land speeders, preferring them over normal bikes, and holds a heavy amount of drop pods. This company is the first to arrive at the World of Fallen, or their own renegades being present, and their captain is as fanatical as he is proud of his work. This company also possesses an extraordinary amount of flyers and use each of them for the perpetual hunt for the Fallen and their own renegades notable special roles within the chapter structure. The Excubite Silentes. With the literal translation being Silent Watchmen, their role is somewhat comparable to that of the Dark Angel's Deathwing Knights. These mighty warriors are the chapter's finest elite, raised from the most accomplished warriors of the First Company, that have served in many campaigns, have proven their ultimate dedication to the chapter's cause, and have shown a great skill with close combat weapons, the latter being a somewhat bizarre requirement, as the chapter commonly prefers the usage of ranged weapons, but similar to the normal Deathwing Knights, one of their many duties is to uphold the ancient martial traditions of Caliban at any cost. Knowledge in the chapter's darkest secrets, including the existence of the Fallen, the subsequent hunt, and the chapter's true heritage, these warriors fight to redeem the chapter and the Unforgiven, proving that their loyalty is unshakable against everything the galaxy can throw at them. Clad in cataphracty armor and equipped with maces of absolution and archaic storm shields, no foe can curb the wrath that these mighty warriors will deliver. Umbre Angeli the changes after the burning of Irritral did not just limit themselves to the chapter's overall spirit and philosophy, but would also have an effect on the chapter's organization. An experimental and highly unusual decision was met within the ranks of the Unforgiven, as the chapter, in its quest for seeking forgiveness from their laxity in the defense of their homeworld, asked that the inner circle of the Dark Angels, whom keep a close eye on their successes, about a very bizarre change in their structure. Though the exact reason for this action is yet to be determined, as the outcome resulted to an overall lesser number of specialist officers within the chapter. The combination of the already well-feared and menacing interrogator chaplains with the structure of the chapter's arcane librarians was indeed a very exotic idea, one that took the council two weeks of continuous debates to decide. The permission was eventually granted, partially because of what the chapter wished to accomplish with this change and because of the idea sparking something akin to curiosity within the ranks of the Dark Angels. A good three centuries had to pass before the changes became noticeable and this newborn creation was indeed something that surpassed expectations. Combining unbreakable will and faith with the mysterious powers of the librarians led to the creation of these Umbre Angeli, warriors of divine might that seemingly can call down the very wrath of the Emperor's wrath from the sky and onto the enemy, inspiring through devotion by their fanatical behavior and speeches as well as their mystical powers. 
Amongst the endless ashen oceans of Eritrea's surface stands one last structure in defiance to its surroundings, a structure that exemplifies both the unwavering persistence and stubbornness of the chapter just as much as their own humbleness. For this monastery was constructed amidst the place where their old fortress ministry lied, once surrounded by a prosperous city the chapter helped to create and vowed to protect. The Pyramid of Azara was seen as a symbol of prosperity, some foolish enough may even say hope, and yet its fate was that of war and ruin. The Blood Crusade of the Sons of Nisiria striked as the chapter was busy with the reclamation of important peace for the Eternal Goliath, slaughtering the populace and letting the blood flow freely through the streets. Upon their return, only the Pyramid was left standing as it valiantly fought off the invaders. The only solution to rid the world from the foul enemies and their taint was merciless orbital fire. The entire surface of the planet was not spared, for the taint of chaos is a stain only removable with the harshest of methods. After the withdrawal of the chaos forces and the subsequent purging of those unable to escape the furious retribution of the chapter, an enormous amount of ash and dust were whirled up into the world's atmosphere and the whole world darkened as a result, as most of the sunlight of the system star was now unable to reach the planet's surface. The surface itself saw itself now completely devoid of life, save for the Pyramid of Azeroth that survived the cleansing thanks to its layered void shields. And yet, despite the survival of their chapter monastery, the chapter saw itself as having once more failed in their duty to protect their homeworld's integrity. Their first homeworld was lost to a treacherous uprising from within the chapter due to the revelation of the chapter's origins, while the second was lost during them pursuing a goal they dared to put above the security of their own home. Instead of trying to rebuild the city or move the Eternal Goliath altogether with its promise of a secure safe haven in space, they would choose to humble themselves instead, erecting a final monument to their sins. Its name is the Eterna Vigilantia, the name representing the simplest of truths that a space marine has to learn. Eternal Vigilance. Notable Members Valerius Sparrow is the current Grandmaster, Chapter Master, of the mysterious and esoteric Templary Skin Day. A consummate warrior and skilled tactician, Sparrow's rise through the ranks of the Chapter to the vaunted rank of Grandmaster was meteoric. Within the ranks of the Templary Skin Day, his skills as a dedicated warrior of the Emperor are without equal. Serving within the various companies of the chapter, Sparrow's skills grew at an exponential rate, and within a span of a little over three centuries, he was appointed as Grand Master of the chapter, a feat which had never occurred in the chapter's history. Mandukto Velstad is the current High Angelican of the Templary Skin Tay. As High Angelican of the chapter, Mandukto is, in effect, serving in the dual role of both Reclusiarch and Chief Librarian of the Umbre Angeli, chaplaincy of the chapter. A figure of awe and dread amongst his battle brothers, Mandukto is an effective spiritual leader for his brethren and a peerless hunter of the fallen. His skills as an interrogator and master torturer are without peer, as he has managed to make fix of the fallen repent of their sins, earning himself the rare recognition of adorning his rosarias with five black pearls, a feat that has yet to be surpassed amongst the ranks of the Umbre and Jelly. In battle, he is often seen wielding his iconic weapon, the Ardentus Interiors, Burning Desire, a massive power bellhammer that burns with the infused power of a fragment of the eternal flame, the Fidelis Perea. Artius Ra is perhaps the chapter's oldest Astartes who is not interred within a dreadnought, sitting at roughly 751 years of active service. They have served within the Scarab Wing for 200 years in total, having managed to even become an Excubite Silentes, making him very much aware of the Unforgivens and Chapter's dark secrets. He is currently attached to the Third Company of the Chapter and is an invaluable member of the Chapter thanks to his seemingly infinite wisdom. Despite this, Artius Ra has actively refused further promotions because he doesn't see himself fit as a figure of leadership and instead prefers to dedicate himself to the chapter's quest for knowledge and their attempt to unlock the past. Ambril is the master of the Excubite and the first captain of the elite First Company, the Scarab Wing of the Templary Skin Tay. 
A formidable warrior and superb tactician, Ambriel has led the first company for several centuries since the death of his predecessor, Master Strawheim, at the hands of the vile Ashen Exiles, Chaos Warband. Ambriel is tasked with the supervision and the initiation of Astartes into the Scarab Wing and personally trains the Excubite Silentis. In battle, Ambriel is clad in the relic Master Crafter Artificer Cataphracty Terminator armor, the will of the Primarch, and crowned with an iron halo. He also wields the arcane paragon blade, Oathkeeper, a potent relic that harkens back to the bygone era of the Great Crusade. This relic is considered one of the chapter's most prized and enduring possessions. Notable Relic War Engines Ira Preteritas this venerable Sicaran Omega was constructed in the ancient forges of Mars, during a time when the golden radiance of the Emperor blessed every man and vehicle loyal and dedicated to his cause. It saw many deployments alongside the Dark Angel's Legion throughout the Great Crusade, but its greatest battle would come with the Rangan Xenocides, when it would utilize its high speed and great firepower to great effect, providing crucial firepower. This tank would be destroyed once during this battle, only to be rebuilt by the order of a Dark Angel's Praetor named Periel, who highly valued the tank for its great performance and several other undisclosed reasons. With the advent of the Templary Sciente's creation being heavily theorized to have taken place during the period of the Second Founding, it would be given to the chapter as a gift, to have its tale continued by their hands and be utilized for the Hand of the Fallen. Embert Crusader Unlike the Ira Praetoritis, the Embert Crusader was not gifted to the chapter, but instead is the fruit of the chapter's continuous efforts of recovering and restoring destroyed wreckages to the best of their abilities. It could be argued as the direct manifestation of the success that comes from such hard labor. It was reported that the chapter's armory dedicated a sizable portion of workforce and no less than 500 entire years of work to the restoration of the tank in M37 as they searched for spare parts across the galaxy. Despite being such a greatly coveted relic and one of the chapter's greatest achievements, it has seen several deployments throughout its rather young history, each of them bringing the gift of extermination to the chapter's foes. Apart from its plasma cannon, the tank also somewhat deviates in its ammunition supply, but it still features the normal shells that are commonly used and shot by its accelerator cannons decorated with shining psychic runes. Angel of Irritrol The Angel of Irritrol is an ancient raptor figure gunship. It had remained dormant for over a millennia now, as the fear of losing the last example of such a potent and venerated war engine has become a grave reality in the decaying Imperium of Man. Certainly, nothing would have changed the chapter's attitude towards the matter, were it not for rumors about an unidentified Adeptus Mechanicus Forge world or Space Marine Chapter Forge that has come into possession of a complete standard template construct imprint for the aircraft. Indeed, Fire Raptors as well as Storm Eagles are noted to be actually wielded in increasing numbers across the countless war zones of mankind to the surprise of many. Upon this revelation, the chapter set out to establish contact with the location that produces these aircrafts. To this day, the source of production remains unknown and whether the Templary managed to locate the source of these vehicles remains a mystery as well. However, during the Battle of Ashen Fates, eyewitness reported that the Angel of Irritual flew once more, followed by two more Fire Raptor gunships, suggesting that the Templary Ski and Tay were indeed successful in establishing contact.